and begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional custodians of the land on which we are gathered here today. I'm on the, I'm on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. As you know, the Rotary Club of Sydney supports the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Welcome to the fifth Rotary Youth Talks. Our leading question at the Rotary Youth Talks is, how do we cultivate youth leadership for a kinder and a better world? Mahatma Gandhi famously said, be the change you wish to see in the world. Rotary Youth Talks are targeted at youth and those working in this space, a place where they share their experiences and insights on youth participation, capacity building and broader engagement. Before we move on to our next part, allow me to invite our past district governor and a Rotarian from Wollongong, my dear friend, Dai North, to say a few words on youth and service. Dai, over to you. Welcome, Dai. Oh, thank you very much, Sonu, for inviting on. Um, I'm always in awe of our younger generations. Today's no exception. I'm really interested in what you've got to say today, Michael. You come with very impressive credentials. I've uh, read, read those. And uh, But first of all, because I live in Wollongong, I'm impressed that you, your, your choice of university in which to study your PhD. So congratulations on that. But as a member of an older generation, I feel that we all want to give our, our knowledge to the younger generations, but we also want to be part of the changing world and learn something as we go along. And I think that as long as we keep learning, we will not be old. Mary McLeod Bethune was an American educator and civil rights activist, and she said, we have a powerful potential in our youth and we must have the courage to change old ideas and practices so that we might, may direct their power towards good ends. So Michael, I wish you all the best for the future and I'm really looking forward to what you have to say today. So thank you. Thank you. Well, beautiful words. Thank you, Di, for your thoughts and continued service and commitment to youth and all things Rotary. Today, we will hear and be inspired by guest speaker, Mr. Michael Valetsky. I hope that's the right pronunciation, Michael. From the University of Wollongong, and I also a past recipient of NYSF scholarship, who will share with us his NYSF journey. On that note, I want to reinforce that this is a safe space where all ideas from everywhere are welcome. So please feel free to participate and share your views through the question and answer chat function on Zoom. We'll also have an opportunity to have a panel discussion later this evening we will be joined by this year's NYSF recipients, including Anna Karina Lloyd, who is sitting with us today, Saloni Jaswal, and hopefully others. Allow me to also extend a special welcome to guests who are joining us here today, especially our dear friend, Lena Suki Skind, who is joining us from Maine in the United States. Welcome, Lena. Always a pleasure to have you. A special welcome to our, our fellow Rotarians uh, from other district, but also you know, from the other part of Sydney, or rather Greater Sydney, uh, Dot Hennessy and past district governor, Di North. Welcome Di and welcome Dot. Now I'd like to invite um, our dear old Rotarian, but um, veteran Rotarian, I must say, <laughs> Dot Hennessy, fellow Rotarian from Wollongong and also a PCYC board member. To introduce our guest speaker following the talk, we'll also have a roundtable discussion. So please stay tuned. Over to you, Dot. Thank you, Sanu, and good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for the very warm welcome. It is indeed a real honor for me to be able to introduce Michael to you today. And I apologize in advance. I'm doing this on my mobile phone. So <laughs> if I lose you or whatever, you understand what's happened. I am so proud of Michael's achievements. Our club sponsored Michael seven years ago, I think it is, Michael. Is that correct? Seven to eight, somewhere around there now. So around there, to go to NYSF. And he's going to share his amazing journey with you. So I don't have to say too much because he's got a wonderful presentation. And we are so proud of his achievement and he just inspires everybody. So I'm not going to take up any of his time, but over to you, Michael and all the very best and thank you. Thanks, Dot. Um, okay, so I'll just share my screen then. Let me get started on that. 
Yes, um, can everyone see the slides come up? Yep, oh, excellent, thank you. All right, so uh, thank you everyone for coming along. It's always a pleasure to share what my experience has been, how it started with NYSF and my journey following that as well and how I ended up with my degree and my field of research and how it's also brought me full circle back to Rotary as well, having recently become with DOT's support and encouragement, a friend of the Wollongong Rotary Club. So my journey again, as I said, it begins with the National Youth Science Forum. So, and not just the National Youth Science Forum, but also an international program coming afterward. So I'd like to start by just, uh, just introducing, introducing my time at NYSF. So I went to, and when I went there, there were three sessions at the time. Session A and C were in Canberra and session B was in Brisbane. I ended up going to session C in Canberra in January, 2014. We stayed at Bergman College, one of the accommodations on the ANU campus, and I was part of the Lyle group. group. So there were groups named after different scientists that put us together, and we got to do a whole bunch of different, different and amazing things, scientific things, workshops and seminars, motivational speakers, but also social events, including some parties, dinners, and chances to form connections and friendships with like-minded people. That, well, that important network of connections. So when I went there, some of the most notable things and I got to do, aside from some parties and dinners when we got to meet people, meet Rotarians, I actually went out to a fossil field, fossil dig site, not quite fossil field, but a fossil dig site. And for the first time in several hundred million years, I picked up, I got to dig open and keep some fossils with some fossilized plants, but also a little fossilized fish as well. So that was a bit of a, um, a geological type of, ex type of event when we got to go out there, see how archaeologists, archaeologists and paleontologists will work back and try and trace back the age of those fossils. And I got to take them home and still have them on display to this day. So we can see me here on the side with I'd with a group Lyle, maybe some of the close students that, students that connected with, a whole group of us as well at the Academy of Science, where we got to have a big presentation from a number of scientists we also visited Geoscience Australia and a few facilities around ANU. And we also went to Parliament House where we met the chief scientist who was also gave us a talk. We went around to a few social events, to, visited the National Museum, visited, went up to Telstra Tower. We had some parties, parties and chances to connect with each other. But also one of my favorite parts, that's being a child who always looked up the stars and thought space sounds amazing. We got to see the Syro Park Space Observatory. So. That was an exciting one when we got to go out there, see them, um, what they do here in Australia. Uh, that was where I learned for the first time in particular, how Australia played such an incredible, important role. We were on the side of the earth facing the moon and we received the first images of the moon landing when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin first stepped down on there. And it came exactly through that facility. And that was also the first time I started to understand when they were talking about how emotional it got for a lot of the astronomers who worked on it, just why it would start, had such an impact to spend 10 or plus years of your life working on something so big and to achieve it. I can see now in my own research why it's such a powerful thing for them. And my time at NYSF really cemented in my mind, yes, I very much want to go into science. And it also encouraged me to go and apply for one of the NYSF international programs, to go to NYSF on the world stage. That is the London International Year of Science Forum. So it was a group of about 450 students from about 74 countries, including Australia. Myself and nine other NYSF 2014 alumni represented our country there. And we attended again, scientific seminars and events and lectures, but also social and cultural events. So we got to go tour around London a bit. We saw the Globe Theatre, uh, there's us again outside of Parliament at the um, Houses of Parliament. We toured Buckingham Palace and then myself there in Savannah here was actually another student from my school. So the, our principal was very excited to have two of us from the same school getting to go. Oh, we as well want to see some important ancient historical landmarks like Stonehenge. There's all of us jumping up in front of it and as, as well as Buckingham Palace. Got to walk past the Queen's throne room. And in true Australian fashion, we had a cultural cabernet and we decided to represent the country dressed as kangaroos, dancing to Lady Gaga's Born This Way. It's a fun little way to show oh, the kind of um, more relaxed, fun-loving style uh, that we wanted to, wanted to present that friendly type of outgoing owing type of a notion. So these science forums were important for me because they, um, while they helped me choose my, science, choose my path into science, science and helped me get, become connected with Rotary to begin with, it, the way that I think they changed me the most was that I was particularly shy and rec more reclusive before going to NYSF. 
And there were talks and seminars there on body language and presentation. So I saw a little giggle from Don. I, know, I think she knows why, because now I, now I don't really stop talking. But um, beforehand, I, I would be quite petrified to go before even just a group of people just here to give a presentation. But NYSF helped me build that confidence and self-esteem enough to do it and show me the skills and techniques of how to do it, how to relax yourself, how to be open and inviting to that audience and how to communicate what you want to say. So it was a really important thing for me, for me. And I think it, and hope that it will have the same types of impacts on other students as well. <laughs> so having begun with this, having done this, I went back and finished high school and my background was again, heavily in math and science. I did extension two, so I was advanced English, physics and chemistry. Kind of wish I'd done a bit of biology as well. I ended up going to medical physics. So <laughs> it would have been nice to actually have that background when I did it, I do think for my degree, but I still enjoy doing modern history and economics. There's my friends and I from high school graduating. But in the end, I ended up choosing to go to the University of Wollongong. And I kind of fell in love with it's really modern and new facilities. So there were, there's a lot of constant expansion and development at Wollongong. A lot of type of new growth, new buildings and institutes, including the Illawarra Health and Medical Research Institute, which is one half, which is um, where I do my primary work work in cancer research and the Center for Medical Radiation Physics, my home institute. And I enjoyed UOW because it's not just got a good reputation, it has a lot of strengths in health and medicine. And I didn't quite realize just how much they really do until I really got involved with them. And so, well, with them. So when I ended up choosing to do my degree on my way to university, I ended up picking medical physics, but it wasn't quite for that. Part of the underlying reason, I really enjoyed physics, even though it was physics because I love math and math I was always good at although physics was my worst subject in HSC ironically <laughs> but I am that here I am doing a PhD in it but I ended up um always having some form of an interest in medicine and my dad often said to me as well he as well wanted to encourage you choose what you want to do but I think it'll be great if you became a doctor so he ended up helping me find we saw this kind of middle ground I thought this is great actually I can experience a lot of different things and that's where my field's often taking me it strikes a balance between physical science and medicine this kind of multidisciplinary skill set, as my professors like to call it. And it is really important in modern science to have that. And I realized that kind of grounding in NYSF in London, showing all these different areas helped me figure that kind of pathway out. So I combined physics, math, math and medicine all together, and then later research skills as well on my path to becoming a medical physicist. And my experience not just allowed me to help establish a network of connections, get involved in research of clinics, but also meet a lot of new people. So there's some of my friends and I, and one of our professors, Dr. Dean Cutterger, joining us at one of our um, annual balls, or balls where balls, these are some of the people I got to work with. And all of us here went on to do masters and PhDs. Most of us doing um, PhDs as well. I didn't actually realize how rare it was outside the field because it's very common in physics that we go off and do it, at least in the UOW School of Physics. Um, a lot of other students will often go off and uh, with their bachelor's or their honors and go and get a job shortly thereafter. But along the way, I did some other great stuff. In 2017, under the new Colombo plan, the director, um, distinguished professor Anatoly Rosenfeld, the director of the Center for Medical Radiation Physics, sent us to Japan and Malaysia to see some of the facilities there with his connections and collaborators and to have a bit of a holiday. So there's Dr. Kanaji again, lying down front and all 10 of us who went, right? And it was a great chance to experience other cultures and it was my first time seeing Japan and Malaysia and they're such beautiful countries and I'd love to have the chance to go back and see them again. I also joined our student-led UOW Physics Society. Um, this was the year where I was elected secretary and my friend Madeline was elected president. As in, and there's me waving over there at our, at our famous liquid nitrogen ice cream events where we give fr um, free flash cooled ice cream out to everyone who wants it. And I get involved with a lot of UOW's extra outreach extracurricular and teaching. So I do a lot of teaching. I've heard about, done just about every role up to including lecturing at some point, actually at some points for it, which I really love this, this sharing of knowledge and helping to shape young minds and inspire others to come and do what I do. I've been part of a lot of their outreach programs like their discovery days. And more recently, I've been elected to some of UOW's governance bodies as a student representative to get involved and help make the university a better place for everyone. So, how I got involved in research was in my third year through an elective project sub subject. So instead of doing a regular subject, I did an elective project in physics worth credit points. And the problem I was being trying to solve since then is fighting against cancer, particularly brain cancer, which is particularly difficult to surgically resection. That is to cut it out, often because some of the types we look at are very deep and it's very risky. And it's often quite resistant to drugs and for chemo and radiation. 
So the solution for my team is to use a form of nanomedicine that's designed to improve and enhance the way radiation works so it can selectively amplify the damage to cancer without harming the rest of the body. And so I ended up joining my research team at CMRP, the targeted nanotherapies team, headed by Dr. Moeva Tahi there. And so my honors here, to rope us into it, Dr. Tahi, <laughs> he decided to take myself and as well my friend Sarah Vogel here. We were, yeah, there's me in the end. We were both recruited by this important person to me here, the now Dr. Ellen Engels. Uh, she's been our mentor for many years and she taught me just about everything I know. And so Alette and Dr. Moeva Tahi took us down with them on a research trip to Melbourne to a particle accelerator called the Australian Synchrotron to use a special form of x-rays there yeah, as part of our attempt to fight and beat brain cancer. So this is, was just prior to honours and that's how he roped us in forever to his research team. And so I did my honours thesis with them, combining um, small amounts of chemotherapeutic drugs and my nanoparticles as a form of nanomedicine to improve radiation treatment. And in 2018, we actually went back where um, Dr. Len Engels led a preclinical trial testing some of the special forms of uh, microbeam radiation at the Australian synchrotron on in combination with nation with nanoparticles on some uh, on some preclinical patients, some live animal rats for them. And we did so with great success. And I'll show that later. And so I ended up graduating with the class of 2018 by the end of my honors year. So this, this is an extension that acts as a great way to get a kind of streamline into a PhD. So I graduated with first class honors in medical and radiation physics. And that's important because doing that in an honors year kind of skips the master's year and sets you up to get a PhD scholarship. So I got the research training program scholarship from the government for it and began my PhD at UOW because I had a grounding there and I fell in love with the research. So I didn't quite know before I did this what I wanted to do with my life. I knew I wanted to do science, but once I fell into this research, I wanted to stay and continue with it ever since because I found that I loved it. So my lesson there is I don't think you need to know immediately, but as long as you have some form of passion, as NYSF told me, go with it and you will find a way to succeed in it and you will eventually find what it is that you love. So I began my doctoral degree at the start of my research career. And so I continued with my project, combining nanoparticles and drugs together, but now with this special form of microbeam radiation therapy at the Australian Synchrotron. And so we do it and in coordination with Dr. Engels and my friend and colleague, Sarah, who now leads some of, a lot of our preclinical trials, why I lead a lot of our cell and laboratory studies, we're working, working to use this special form of radiation therapy MRT for short, to do three things, improve outcomes for the patient survival and ideally try and eliminate cancer altogether. And you know, when patients have brain cancer, management to ensure quality of life after treatment, and as well as apply existing clinical practices in treatment planning. So this is how we actually plan out a treatment properly for a patient and in so doing, provide an accurate and effective treatment that's personalized to that patient, exactly as they would do in the hospital. So this is important because a lot of the medical world is now moving toward personalized medicine and that important special treatment for each patient. And it's also important for ensuring the best possible outcomes for a patient as well. So we make it clinically applicable by having um, just here. So again, Moeva Tahi leads it and Associate Professor Stephanie Corday Tahi is the Deputy um, Chief Medical Physicist for Radiation Oncology at Prince of Wales and Moeva's lovely wife. So she's an Associate Professor Honorary at UOW. And she has decades of experience under her belt as a medical physicist. And so she applied exactly the clinical practices she does at the hospital for her patients to treat our rats. So it's a direct application. So we can personalize the medicine exactly as we would do for a human patient. So this has been important for us. And our goal is to move our nanomedicine as a complement to make this even better. Now I've noted a lot of these words, but I haven't quite explained how they all work. So the way our nanoparticles work and what they do is that they're meant to be eaten by cancer cells and then we fire a beam of x-rays at them. So this is some x-rays. So the same time you might fire in the hospital when you want to treat cancer on a patient. And so the nanoparticles, these black dots, and I have to give a lot of credit for this, will be this great diagram, will be eaten up by a cancer cell. And then when you hit them with the x-rays, it almost like detonates them like a grenade, sets them off with a little almost boom within the cell and it causes there is electrons floating around all the atoms to go flying off like the fragmentation on a grenade would. And when this hits nearby structures in the cell, particularly the DNA, it tears it apart and is designed to kill the cancer cell. So we look for selective nanomedicine that will work exclusively on this type of cancer 
on the type of brain cancer that we're looking at and ideally later on other types of cancer. So we can inject it and it will be taken up specifically. And when we fire the x-rays, it'll amplify the damage just to that. So that way we could use less radiation, which makes it less harmful and effective on the patient, but still get the same type of treatment exactly as we would apply to the cancer. Now, I also mentioned this kind of book, sorry, called the synchrotron. So the synchrotron, again, quite literally accelerates particles really, really fast. And the difference between the x-rays it gives, well, if we look at common x-rays used in a hospital, they use what we call broad beams or broad shapes. So it might just be a square or a circle, maybe a potato, <laughs> if your tumor is in the shape of a potato, to just broadly hit the whole tumor with x-rays. What the synchrotron does is it spins particles around really, really fast in here. And then little offshoots like that, they call them beam lines, and they might have a way in there. You can put something in the way and blast it with those x-rays. And what it does is it wiggles them using magnetic fields really fast so that it generates a lot of x-rays really quickly. And so, my apologies, I thought I charged this. And so what happens when these x-rays come off, it doesn't deliver more x-rays than you would normally get. It just delivers the same amount really, really quickly because there's so many of them at once. We call this a really fast, brilliant beam of x-rays. And this has unique effects in treating cancer while sparing potentially healthy tissue. And so what we apply is this form of therapy using micro beams. So we use these really, really tiny, thin beams, only usually about 50 micrometers thick. And we pass these beams through these slits here to get them to block out most of it and only get these concentrated X-ray beams. And it has this special effects where it can avoid harming anything healthy while still doing all the effective treatment of the tumor and creates a much, much better system for treating a patient where it has minimal effects on the patient, but still successfully can get rid of their cancer. And so the primary difference then between them is that if you imagine it from the front and you get a regular type of treatment in a hospital of radiation, you might get a blast of a square or a circle or your potato. And notice how it's all colored in because it hits everything that gets caught. So any healthy cells around it or along the way will get harmed. With the micro beams, they're only thin lines and you just move them through the tumor. And you can see how much white space there is that's not getting hit. So this is important because we found it hits all of the tumor, these dense little lumps with all this powerful hit and successfully treats it, but it spares most of the healthy tissues around it. And this is important for trying to be really selective and really precise with our type of treatments. And this is what we're looking to develop in conjunction improved by our nanomedicine. So we get to basically this year for the last few slides, 2020, a bit delayed for obvious reasons, thanks to the pandemic. But 2021, we managed to finally start continuing, aside from a bit of a Victoria Sydney issue, New South Wales and Sydney Victoria issue more recently. We conducted another preclinical trial of our microbeams to treat uh, more of our rats. And the reason that's so special to us, I noted earlier we've had great success. So just like a minute to just introduce everyone to Martin. Now, Martin's a special hero for us because he was a preclinical patient who had brain cancer very early in his life. Rats like Mon only lived for two years. He was born in 2017, and cancer in his brain would often, take, often end his life within a few weeks. Mon actually passed away in mid-2019. He lived his full two years because our MRT treatment cured him. We successfully eliminated his brain cancer. Now, I do admit that he was only one patient out of the group that did it, but it's so important because most patients for this type of cancer only have a 5% chance of surviving five years. We managed to cure Martin with one shot zap of radiation. And this was special for us because it was proof that what we're trying to do can be done. It's just difficult to redo it, but that's what we're working to do, to be able to do it on demand to help our patients. And so that was my, my most recent project was to take some cell samples for us. And this is what I did just earlier this month, still ongoing. So I don't quite have the results yet. I'm flying back tomorrow for um, or for the last bit of it and then coming back. But we did a process to a few hundred samples. We did it over five days of access. So a lot of sleep was lost, but it was well worth it by the looks of the preliminary results coming in. And we tested dozens of our different types of nanoparticles and drugs and combinations to try and make this work, make this work and bring this arsenal eventually to use with MRT. So we can eventually move to those preclinical and later human preclinical trials in the coming, coming years and decades. So we can bring this 
for off to patients. And this is where my research is at and what I do and what MY7, the path in mindset have inspired me to take, just following my passion. And so for the final slide, I just want to note how my, self, how my journey comes full circle. And as I said, with the support and encouragement of DOT, I have able, been able to come back and join Rotary as a friend and young scientist. So I joined the Rotary Club of Wongong within our district 9675. So there was the um, UOW head of, head of School of Psychology, Professor Peter Caputi, the previous president of Wonga Rotary Club. And I was inaugurated by him at the same time as David Tresky, the current president, president um, as in took over. And I have been a friend of the Wonga Rotary Club um, since then this year. And then there's Dot and, uh, and Debbie as well, touring the Alora Health and Medical Research Institute you just kind of see the work we do because we're very open with what we want to do and what the institutes want to do is really showcase and have this important community connection that Rotary is so good with to really showcase to others how we can all work together to beat all these types of diseases that we work on in labs like that. And so that is my story. So that's been my journey from M Rotary and MISF back to Rotary and from owning MISF again and as a young scientist. So thank you all so much for the opportunity to share and I'm more than happy to discuss anything or take any questions. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Michael. And, um, you know, really brilliant um, talk. And I, I, you know, I hope that all the audience and, you know, will, will really see through the great work that you're doing at Wollongong. Well, we now have a roundtable discussion where we shall explore the opportunities that come through NYSF scholarship, as you have seen with Michael and uh, how it can act as a catalyst to the recipients. Michael, uh, can I invite you to join the, 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 the round table? And I also wanna invite um, Anna Karina Loy, who is um, the current um, um, NYSF recipient for this year from Rotary Club Sydney. So Anna, can you um, can you unmute yourself as well? And and uh, Michael, if you can stop sharing so that we can uh, put both of you on the on the screen. Um, fantastic. Um, so I'm just trying to find Anna and yes, um, fantastic. Welcome, Michael and Anna. And um, um, before I start, Michael, and, and just a you know first question about. So you, you shared your journey from uh, about seven to eight years ago when one NYSF scholarship made you to have a taste of science and STEM and medicine in general, and then you got motivated to pursue honors and then and masters and then and a PhD. What would be your, um, you know, if you could share with the audience here that why did you choose medical physics as a discipline to pursue this program? And second, what will be your recommendation for other youth scholars who are looking to get a NYSF scholarship? What's the recipe, Michael? Um, I think it's mostly following whatever passion you might have. So I've often told many students over the years now that I do a fair bit of teaching as well at UAW. Um, basically, and I, the same thing I say as well to a lot of students who are coming from high school, uh, don't panic too much about your ATAR or think that you have to choose your whole future <laughs> within the coming year or two. You don't. As I noted, I found what I loved by my third year. So I tried medical physics because as I said, I, I really enjoyed physics. It wasn't necessarily my best subject in HSC, but I loved the math, I loved the concepts and I put my passion into it. And now I'm doing a PhD in it. And I tried it because it had this multidisciplinary approach, this combination of physics, of mathematics and dabbling in medicine and the biology and chemistry behind it as a chance to kind of touch with everything and see what it is I really enjoyed the most and how most and what area I wanted to fall into and really focus on. And so by staying in that degree and thinking this is interesting enough, I'm gonna stick with it and see where it goes by just following that passion and giving it a go. And this is the biggest thing I encourage my students, have a go and see what you can do with it. I was lucky enough to be recruited by Dr. Engels and joined that, my research team and I've stayed ever since because I found that with that more diverse skill set built up, I could do a lot of the things in the field, I could learn them and I found that I loved it. And that was really important for me. So big take home message I would give is, if you have a chance to go to NYSF, go to NYSF. Or if someone is looking to go there, encourage them to do it. Encourage them to take the opportunity just to see what it is they like and what others like to meet other people, to have that experience because they'll help in the long run. Even if it takes several years, 
just having it there, you're going to reflect on something and eventually you will find what it is that you know is that you want to do. And I think it's important. The best advice is to have that, have a go and to follow it where it's going to take you. Thank you, Michael. And seeing is believing. And, you know, like when you go to these programs, you see others doing it and you think, oh, my gosh, you know, I can do it as well. Yeah. Now, just to complement this question, also to welcome Anna Karina Lloyd. Anna applied uh, for NYSF scholarship this year, and uh, I'm proud to say that Anna has received the scholarship. So we are looking forward to Anna, you know, pursuing the NYSF program. Anna, welcome to the club. And if you can tell us every a little bit about yourself, Anna. Uh, sure. Um, I'm from Sydney. I go to St. Vincent's College in, um, in the city. I really like sort of biology and chemistry because it's sort of got like, compared to like English, it's only got like one right answer. So that kind of like logical approach to it, it's a lot easier to approach when like doing exams and stuff. It's a lot more, um, I guess, only like it's logical, yeah. Um, I, at, I, at NYSF, I'm hoping I've written it down. There are a couple ones which I really want to do. I want to do the UCS, the forensic science, because forensic science is really interesting to me. Um, and I want to go to the um, CSIRO uh, center in Linfield because uh, my dad said that was a really good one to sort of look at. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, fantastic, uh, Anna. And I can see there are some few questions uh, coming up on the uh, thing. So um, Ronnie first, Ronnie, over to you. Ronnie, if you have a question. Well, I, I was first going to comment, Michael. Um, Fanu first introduced me as being in the Queen Bianne area at the time when you were at NYCF. I was actually part of the Canberra region for Rotary and was actually on the district committee for selecting um, students. So your year was the second last year. I remember that opening dinner that we had. You were actually the most quietest person there. It was so hard to get anything out of you, other than I want to explore all my options that are available. And I actually think you did do that, because what you're doing now is so far removed from what maybe originally you were thinking about doing. And I'm so pleased about that, because Anna, NCYF gives you all the opportunities to see so many sides of science that people don't realise that are there. And it also gives you the opportunity to investigate particular universities that you might want to go to and having one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings with them to actually see how you can fit in. So, Michael, my question is going to be, with that follow-up with going to universities, because I think you lived in the Wollongong area, you go to Wollongong, do you feel that you missed out something in there investigating so many universities? Or you were just so much in luck at being able to be living close to where the best place for you to study. And also congratulations on doing the international as well as focusing on the, the body um, system on how that works, which also we pick up in RILA and other systems to bring out on other people. Um, I'm just so impressed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that means quite a lot. I'm glad, I'm glad that I, my memory definitely serves. And as, and as I said, definitely I was a quiet person beforehand. So I think that's, as I know, one of the biggest impacts that NYSF teaches you. It's okay. That was, I think, a great way to describe it. It's okay. And I think that was that's, it speaks to the importance of um, what, what Rotary does. Uh, one thing that's always really spoken to me, particularly in the last year, has been the Rotary mantra of service above self. And that's in great part why I do what I do, because for me, it's just the chance to help others. I really can't help myself half, half the time. And it's also important because I am often, I'm the type of person who is at my happiest, often when everyone else around me is happy. So if I'm able to help others and inspire them on that path, then that's a reward unto itself for me. Um, so I ended up picking UAW in part because I was local, but I don't think it's actually cost me any opportunities. And it's for a similar reason that while there are great benefits, maybe you for sending, um, say your child to maybe a selective school or a private school, it doesn't really compromise their education. They still get the same type of value. And it's the same thing because what matters in the end is that you have good teachers and good mentors. And as I said, Dr. Engels 
has been really important to me because she taught me just about everything I know. And I've been surrounded and I've been quite blessed. And I think it really speaks to the saying that it takes a child to raise a village by a lot of people who've been really supportive. So Rotary has been a big part of that story, particularly in the last decade of my life. I've shown, I've given me these opportunities. Um, Dr. Engels has, I've had a lot of mentors over the years in teaching in my research, which is quite a few of which, most important, which have actually been women, which is actually rather rare in the field of physics. We actually, it's a very male dominated field. So having a chance to learn from quite a few women in the field has actually been really valuable for me as well. And in the end, I don't think it's changed anything for the same reason as the schools, because I still get to go, for example, to Melbourne and the Australian synchrotron is there, but it works in coordination as well with Monash University, which is right across the road. And so I use some facilities and institutes associated with them. The synchrotron is a part of the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization. So again, there's that connection there. And this all goes back to that exactly as Rotary does, this importance of connecting people to bring them together. So I don't actually think it's, I missed out any opportunities for it. I actually think that by having somewhere where I have been supported constantly and lifted up by people around me, whether around me, people of all ages and backgrounds, whether they're in Rotary or in my local community, to be able to do the things I do, I've had possibly more opportunities than someone else who might have gone to another place, but might not have had that important, important network of support because I've had people who backed me up all the way. And I've said to my professors that I think they're arguably the world's greatest PhD supervisors because they've always been behind me. No matter what the case has been, they've always been on my side. And that's been really important for me because then having that support means that any opportunity that comes my way, I can take it and know that I'm not going to miss out on something. Absolutely. Fantastic, Michael. Um, and uh, you know, opportunities come with great mentorship. So um, it's important to have identified good mentors and very glad to hear about your mentorship stories that you've got at the University of Wollongong. Now, can I invite uh, past president Kathy Tate? Uh, Kathy, you have a question? Yeah, I do. I have one for Michael and one for Anna. Uh, first, Michael, um, given that your focus is research based, I'm curious whether um, you've built up a global community to help collaborate around your studies in nanoparticle medicine. And uh, if that's an effective way for you to speed up some of the uh, research outcomes. Um, it, cert it certainly would be, and that is something that we are, are actually looking at at my institute and my research team. So again, not just the national one by working down with our connections down at the Australian Synchrotron, but again, we have teams at um, at the Center for Medical Radiation Physics who work with um, special particle therapy facil therapy facilities in universities in Japan, and as well as connections, a distinguished professor Rosenfeld has connections to, I believe it was a university in California, I think it was Loma Linda University, where as well they had that type of action, and that is something we're definitely looking at, because again, in the fight against cancer is a global one for us, and it is an important one, because there's always something to share, so whether it's at national conferences or working with other peoples around the world. And again, we also as well, my team has collaborators um, in France because um, the, the professors run my team, well, even Stephanie are actually themselves of French origin. And so they have collaborators there that we are working with. And one of my colleagues is actually looking at going there on a scholarship next year to work with them. And so that is an important part of it because it's bringing people and ideas from, you know, from around the world who have these, um, this important expertise, and this is something that's I've, that I've um, been in meetings for where it's been noted, having people who have this important knowledge base or experience base coming together to put their expertise in when they're the expert at that and to have everyone do it makes for a better project. So that has been an important part. It's something I think we'll definitely look more at. I know that for the microbeam radiation therapy, I've heard recently that um, there are teams in Europe who are looking from one of our collaborators from Germany who are looking at writing up the first human clinical trials to take place by mid-decade for it as well. So again, it's all that kind of exciting knowledge of who's doing what and how we might get involved. That is a part of it for us. Thank you, Michael. And Anna, if um, you know, so I know that you are now deciding on choosing a biochemical or biomedical engineering. What is, what is that you drives you to this uh, discipline? Um, I think the aspect of being able to help people in the future with the whole like medical side 
um, but also of the engineering part because I love art and creative creative stuff too. I think somehow implementing that into in, in, into engineering would also be good. I feel like engineering is one of the sort of sciences where you can have a creative aspect to it with like designing stuff. Um, yeah. Fantastic, Anna. And um, well, I have a question from another biomedical engineer for you and uh, Lena, Lena, over to you. Oh, yeah, I just, um, I'll, I'll do a, a comment. But Loma, Loma Linda, one just little tidbit for everyone to know, they have the highest um, life expectancy in the United States and one of the highest in the world oh. in Loma Linda. Yeah. So, um, I wonder uh, if it's for the, and because it, of their facilities. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they also have um, the specific uh, religion that's prevalent there, but it, it involves a certain diet. And they were actually uh, included in a documentary. The, a surgeon there was like 94. He was a surgeon still. And the only reason he retired wasn't because he was 94 and he was tired. He could have kept going. <laughs> But he retired because he decided he needed to spend more time with his family. <laughs> so there you go. Um, but just regarding biomedical, I, I you know, I, I find Michael, your presentation was amazing. And I think one of the things that it brings forward is how multidisciplinary um, these, um, you know, things are now. Uh, and way back when I, I did biomathematics back then, it was mathematical modeling and biological systems. And it was very new. There were only three of us out of 30,000 students. And I didn't even know it existed. I mean, it was only because I went crying to my advisor that I hated you know, what I was doing. He's like, you're good in math. Why don't you do the biomath program? I'm like, what's that? So we didn't know these things existed. And there was a big argument back then about whether you should, um, you know, uh, stick with one discipline at a time and just do the different degree levels in different disciplines rather than doing them all at once. And I think now that's proven to be the best way to work as multidisciplinary. So uh, for Anna, uh, other than the biomedical engineering and biomath and those things that you hear about, there's actually loads of stuff and more on the creative side than engineering as well. Like even engineering can take you creative, but there's even more. So keep keep exploring. And I think NYSF will probably help you. And I think Michael's experience, Michael, how did you go from the uh, from doing the NYSF and then going into the more international program and going to the L, is it LYSF? Or? L, yeah, yeah. L-Y-S-F. Could you please explain that? Because I think for Anna, that would be really good to um, know. So that that was actually um the international programs from mysf for an extension of mysf so like they're they their own programs independently run of course but um mysf is very intertwined with it and provided the application for it so i applied afterwards was through um and through i think it was the mysf website but i remember website, but i remember certainly applying afterwards for it to go through them and then they were through them and then there was i think um about at least a third of all the um at least a third of all the applicants uh, of all the mysf students for that year all the mysfers efforts applied for international programs so there were a few tens of spots available depending on the program so there was 10 for london and i applied for that or that in the same way you, um you might apply for mysf although i don't remember there being an interview process i think it was based on um based on your responses primarily that you put in there as well as their experience with you for mysf and from there then I remember I just waking up one morning before school, getting an email, and I couldn't believe I was when it said congratulations. And it said it was a very competitive process. You know the typical way they might for a university, it makes it sound disappointing. It says, but congratulations, before you shout out for the rooftops, you've been selected as one of 10 to go. And I thought, oh, oh wow. So it, it ended up just being an application really afterwards that NYSF put through, and then they sent us as Australia's representatives. Into- oh, so th- thank you for that. But I just wanted to say it's interesting how TNT moved from being an explosive <laughs> to TNT treating people. So there yeah, you that, go. Good that job. was because Dr. Ta, he loves the song TNT, it's dynamite. So he deliberately named the team after it. <laughs> that was his actual reason for it. Thank um, you, Michael. In in the interest of time, I can I now invite uh, past president Kathy Tate to give a vote of thanks. Kathy, over to you. Uh, Sonu, I know that 
Dot had her hand up. Dot. Dot, do you have a question, Dot? Just very quickly, Michael might share with you very quickly that yes, you do get selected, but it does cost you to go to that next step. Mm -hmm. And he yes. was very innovative and very, very forthright in making sure he went. And I think it's a real credit to him. You can hear how his passion and everything uh, has brought him where he is today. He's an amazing um, uh, ambassador, not only for, uh, for NYC, but for youth programs in Rotary and how from one thing you can lead to another. But he might just share quickly with you how he ended up getting to London. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. I'm glad you reminded me of that. I almost, I thought about it earlier and almost forgot about it. I am um, also, um, Wollongong Rodeo Club absolutely helped as well. As didn't, well, I remember um, going at the time, Dot. This was actually the first time I met Dot from what I remember. And we got to sit with her and get to know her. It was in mid-2014 at their changeover, Wollongong Rodeo Club's changeover dinner. And we were up in the fraternity club, I think it was, was and was and we got to see the process and Rotary helped by making a donation and Dot herself also came along as well to the biggest thing. Um, myself and I mentioned Savannah who also went to my school. Uh, Savannah's mother um, is very much involved in community groups in Wollongong and she, um, my mom reached out to her and we decided we'd host a trivia night fundraiser at the fraternity club. So Savannah's mother was an excellent organizer and then we worked with her to get everything together. And Savannah and I managed to raise about $5,000 from friends, family, community. Dot as well came along long for rotary support and managed to basically it was ten thousand dollars was the cost for each of us so that two and a half thousand each for the five thousand that night was an excellent boost to go there and i think as well it was definitely uh, there was a massive donation as well from rotary to help out to come in and cover another large chunk of the cost as rotary does with their youth support and i think as well my local mp at the time uh, at local mp at the time sharon bird also made a donation as well because i think don introduced us there for the first time as well and when she heard about it she her office made a small donation as well to help get us there so it was a definitely like as i said it takes a village to raise a child and it's, um, to have that support network from my school my community friends and family from rotary even from our local elected officials that uh, is a whole huge part of how it all came together and came to be thank you michael rotary indeed is that village and hopefully this village will support many of you, uh, scholars like you and Anna Karina on your screen is one of them. So we wish you, you wish you all the best. Uh, uh, Kathy, over to you. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Sanu. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Anna. Um, first of all, I think we need to name you ambassador of this program, Michael, so <laughs> that you can truly so you can inspire and spread the word and uh, Anna I'm sure you were inspired as all of us are on this particular talk. Um, I can't say enough about um, some of the courage it takes for you to investigate this line of study. Many have I'm sure tried but uh, I think what you've done is um, not only taken your passion, but you actually sourced, how is it that I can actually bring this to reality? And uh, that takes a lot of perseverance. And you touched on something interesting, which was uh, what you learned at some of the workshops. Uh, and that was around some of the soft skills. So I think yourself and your colleagues are brilliant people. And sometimes brilliant people have difficulty getting their message across. And I think uh, what you've done as far as focusing on, it's not just you know, what the content is, it's about how can I communicate and connect with people. And indeed, hopefully patience in the end, so that they can realize what a tremendous, tremendous accomplishment you and your colleagues have made to the field of physics and science, and of course, medicine. So um, I really wanted to touch on that because it's a critical part of research and it's a critical part of being a successful scientist as well, an investigator. 
I was really happy, by the way, that uh, you and your friends also did the practical chemical application of developing ice cream by using the liquid nitrogen. That is a fantastic <laughs> accomplishment as well. But, um, you know, when you said that this is all about delivering better outcomes and delivering more personalized treatment in medicine, I mean, what a wonderful message and what a wonderful, um, you know, strategic initiative that is. That's something that people can get. That's something that people can understand and patients can understand. And then when you're uh, talking about your underlying motivation is service above self, that's really music to all of our Rotarian ears. And I'm sure the ears to everyone else out there. I guess um, as some final points, you also talked about it's unusual to see women, um, as many women as men um, practice in this particular area. And I remember way back when, when I used to do public speaking, I think I was 10 years old, and I talked about Madame Curie, who actually is responsible for naming radioactivity. Even though she wasn't the discoverer, she was the one who named it. So I think finally, um, Anna, if Michael hasn't uh, inspired you, I don't know who will, but love to see you as an ambassador for this program. And um, I wouldn't be surprised, Michael, if you're going to be up there winning maybe the Prime Minister's Prize in Science, and who knows, you may go on to be in Stockholm with a Nobel. So congratulations. We're very grateful for what you're studying. You're going to make a huge impact in the world, and we can't thank you enough. Thank you, Kathy, and um, really nice words there. Um, and I, I, and on that note, I want to um, acknowledge Michael and Anna Karina for sharing their passion and journey with us today. And a big thanks to all the guests and Rotarians who joined us at this event and for, for your support for Rotary Youth Talks. We have some exciting events lined up this December at Rotary Club of Sydney. On 7th of December, we'll, having, we'll be having our AGM at 12.30 p.m. And on 13th December, our Climate Action Group, led by Thelma Raman, will be holding a talk by Caroline Pitcock on sustainable buildings in sustainable cities at 5.30 p.m. So please don't forget to sign up for these events. It's available through our website, sydneyrotary.com. Before we close, I have some concluding thoughts uh, for, all of, for all of us to reflect. I am um, at a very young age, I was the recipient of Marie Curie Fellowship, the Nobel Prize winner, Marie Curie, and I had an opportunity to work for two years in, in Netherlands at the Centre Outbound University Medical Centre, where I trained in, in nuclear medicine and neurology, and uh, an opportunity to work. And at that time, I think um, it was some of those mentors who supported me was critical to my journey in medicine and research. So um, it, it just, you want to reinforce in, in ideas that, you know, it's important to have mentors around you and to pursue something that you are passionate about, no matter how uh, difficult that path would be in future. So continue to, you know, chase what your dreams and you might be, your dream might just become a reality. Now, Nobel laureate Albert Einstein, who you all know for his outstanding work in physics, have had his own shares of struggles during his youth. He started talking relatively late, started school at six and a half, and some of his teachers didn't find him remarkable. No wonder Einstein was disdainful of a school and hated strict protocols. Though away from people's eyes, the young boy started reading college level physics books at the age of 11 and became an ardent admirer of Immanuel Kant, as you know, the great philosopher Kant. After reading his book, Critique of the Critique of Pure Reason at 
at the age of 13. So he was uh, started dabbling in philosophy as much as he dabbled in physics. And I, being somebody who's a big fan of underdogs in my life, after his, so when you read about Albert Einstein after his death, several theories have emerged about learning disabilities in his early years, which was suggestive of dyslexia. While others have, uh, have indicated probably he was facing, he, he experienced ADHD at a young age because he used to daydream in school and was often forgetful. Some has also characterized his difficulties with social interaction, repetitive patterns of behavior as characteristics of autism disorder, as you know, what we call Asperger's syndrome. Nevertheless, it's hard to establish a diagnosis posthumously because Einstein is not there with us anymore. But what we can definitely comment on is that despite the challenges Einstein faced, he went on to become one of the most celebrated mathematician, physician of our time, physicist of our times, who developed the special and general theory of relativity and pioneered several key developments in this space. He was the Nobel Prize recipient in 1923. We need to support Einsteins of the world, nurture them, encourage them, believe in them as they shape their journey and learn to fly their paper planes with the conviction that they might be able to be on the front seat at one day. Must I remind, it is free to attend Rotary Youth Talks for all Rotarians of all ages and including non-Rotarians. So if you know someone who you wish to nominate or wish to attend this event, please give me a buzz. I'll leave you with these words of Loyola F. Fian, who said the youth is not a time of life, it is a state of mind. You're as old as your doubt, your fear, your despair. The way to keep young is to keep your faith young, keep your self-confidence young, keep your hopes young. On that note, I declare this meeting adjourned and the floor is open for fellowship and you're welcome to stay for another few minutes. Thank you, everyone.